time I was already a clinical, I've been a clinical hypnotherapist for the last 10 years plus. Mm. But having those experiences, I felt, um, I kind of like this, in, in hypnosis, we learn about our mind, mind's capacity to delete, distort, and generalize things. Mm. So when you accept someone, what happens is like, even if you see something as negative, you actually delete those information. Right. Yeah. So you totally ignore it and you don't want to hear about it or you, your subconscious mind don't really take it into consideration. Yeah. So what happened to me was like, I was like, wow, you know, what's happening there is really amazing. This is the place for me to be, mm -hmm. uh, you know, be and be enlightened. So that's the reason I ended up going there. Wow. So looking back, uh, I just, I don't want to divert your story, but when you look back now at those experiences that kind of swayed your opinion of Nityananda, do you now consider those to be hypnotically induced? Definitely, 100%. Wow. Um, yeah, 100%. The reason that I'm saying that is because you see people jumping around in, uh, you know, uh, when Nityananda is there, he's yeah. moving hand and doing all those kind of stuff. And if you look at that with some of these church group, yes, you see some of these uh, people jumping around and doing pretty much the same thing. It's yeah. not just because of somebody's power. It's just because of your, your own consciousness plays, playing with you. Wow. You know, I, I, I can't talk about Kundalini experience, experiences and all that and say whether if it's true or not, because it could be beyond all that as well. But I can talk based on my, um, my experience as a hypnotherapist. If you, like for example, if you start trusting me, if I start building rapport with you, then whatever the suggestion that I give you, you will start behaving like that. So for example, I can, hypnotizing is not somebody is just waving something in front of you and asking you to go to sleep. It's mm. just, you know, watching TV, if you accept something as true, it is hypnosis. So mm. if I give you some sort of um, something, if I say something and you accept that as true, then it will go through your analytical faculty into your subconscious mind. Mm. And then, for example, if I say your um, you are not uh, Sarah, from now on, you are Michael Jackson. Hmm. Then you will believe that. But once we recondition you again and again a few times, what happened to that is that you absolutely believe that you are Ma Michael Jackson. Yeah. So your analytical fa faculty will be like, um, it's like a filter. Once it goes, those information goes through your analytical faculty into your subconscious mind, then it has to be reprogrammed by someone who's experiencing that. Right. And I mean, as you're saying this, it's, it's bringing back the memory to me of when he told me you are no longer Sarah or Sudevi, which was the first spiritual name he gave. You are Swarupa Priya. You are a Mahant. You were born for this mission. You're my female extension. I myself am living through your body. Suddenly all my old identity associations kind of melted away. And in That's any right. moment before I decided, um, you know, for example, I grew up, I've always hated butter. I just, I'm vegan. I've been vegan since age 13, but as a little kid, I've never liked the taste of butter or the texture of butter. Um, but I remember once on Krishna Janmastami, Nityanand was giving butter as prasadam. And I remember holding that butter thinking, I don't like butter. And, and then thinking, oh, but I'm not Sarah anymore. I'm Swarupa Priya. I'm his extension. He likes butter, so I must like butter. And damn, I ate pure butter, which looking back, I get like a gag reflex thinking about it. But at the time, I enjoyed it. And I, and I, I believe now... Just the way you're describing this, that must have been a, a hypnotically induced, um, like I must have filtered out my own preferences and replaced it with his identity. It's a little scary to think of it that way that, you know, when people talk about brainwashing, um, the typical examples given are usually um, like the, the Chinese who brainwashed American soldiers to become, you know, communist 
Um, or there's cases like Patty Hearst, who was brainwashed and became a rebel against her own family. But is there kind of a difference between hypnosis and brainwashing, or, or is hypnosis a part of the brainwashing system? So hypnosis is actually a very broad term. Okay. So the brainwashing will fall under hypnosis where they will use certain techniques from hypnosis to do the brainwashing. So changing the names and, uh, you know, uh, making them believe that, you know, this, your past no longer matter or yeah. making them to believe some, in something else is mm -hmm. hypnosis. So a lot of people would say, uh, I can't be hypnotized because I'm strong or, yeah. um, you know, all kind of these things. But as long as you, you are a human being and mm. you can take instruction, mm. that means you can be hypnotized. Mm. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. And the, the lifestyle that we were living there, I mean, for the paid program for Inner Awakening, um, participants were given a little bit more sleep than the people living residentially as Adinavasis, but by a little more, I mean four to six hours a night max. People actually living as Adinavasis, like there were nights where we only had less than an hour to lie down on our bed. Then we had to jump up, take a cold shower, run for yoga, stay awake until past midnight, and then repeat the whole thing again the next day. Um, would that also be conducive towards that hypnotic state or the, the brainwashing? Because I, I've read that sleep deprivation is one of the most damaging things that can be done to the human brain. Yes, because what happened there is like, if you shut down your analytical faculty, mm. you know, like when you allow the analytical faculty take over, mm. you, you can deprogram all the things that was programmed in you. So if somebody is not allowing you to use your analytical faculty, they are controlling you, making you tired all the time. What's going to happen to your analytical faculty? It's also tired. It's not, it doesn't have time to reflect on what the hell is going on. Mm. So you just, you know, as, as soon as you get time, you just go straight to the bed. You just want to lie down and then you just have to rush and then get up and have shower. Usually there's no water when I was there. Yeah. I was yeah. the that was fun <laughs> when I was there too, the, the whole time. Yeah. yeah. So you just have to get ready. And then there were a few guys um, in the beginning where they, they don't know how to wear dhoti and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. You help them out and then you have to rush the puja. You have to do all those things. Um, and what happened when you, don't allow your analytical fa faculty to work is that you will accept all the information to go directly into your subconscious mm -hmm. mind. So one of the technique in conversational hypnosis or in even some of the advertising companies uses this technique is that they will use some sort of confusion technique there that will keep your anal analytical faculty occupied. Mm. So your analytical faculty like to analyze things, right? So mm. once you are occupied with something else, what they will do is they will put some program to go into your subconscious mind. Mm. So when it goes into your subconscious mind, if you are not really familiar with that, you will start to believe that's my decision. I made that decision. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like yes. um, if, if you watch um, Darren Brown, Darren is D E W -R, R E and Darren Brown on YouTube, um, mm -hmm. he will ask someone face to face, what is your favorite thing or whatever, or he will ask someone to write it down and put it in an envelope and then keep it somewhere safe. He wouldn't touch it. Mm -hmm. And then he will actually use conversational hypnosis and then make them believe that they want something else. Mm -hmm. And then there, he will directly ask, so what, what, what is your favorite thing? What do you like? And then they will be like, oh, this is my favorite thing. Mm. And then they will 100% believe that's their favorite thing. Wow. And then Darren Brown will open his, um, the envelope and then he will show it to them and say, this is your handwriting, isn't it? Mm. And they'll be really surprised. And then he will show it to them. You know, you said this is what your favorite thing was in the beginning. After this, now you're saying this is your favorite thing. It's totally something else. Right. So that's right. how powerful these 
conditioning can be. You know, some people get scared of uh, the word hypnosis, but it's nothing to be scared of because it's always happening to all of us. Right. You know, from our parents, from our colleagues, from our friends, medias, yeah, society, from everything. We are, we have it conditioned regularly, always. Right. What's a little unnerving about this is that it sounds very familiar in that Nityananda, I don't like to call him Nityananda, I'll say Niti or, but you know, they yeah. call him Poops or the, you know, the frog who calls himself Nityananda. Uh, he used to tell us that he's not brainwashing us, he's washing our brains. And yeah. I remember in one specific satsang, he actually said, um, you know, brainwashing means planting things into your head to hurt you. I'm not brainwashing you. I'm washing your brains. I'm removing all the old cognitions, all your old beliefs, all the things society programmed into you so that these can be upgraded. So basically, it's the same damn thing. He was telling us, I'm not brainwashing you. I'm brainwashing you. And yeah, that's, also, um, yeah. that's one of the things uh, when you use conversational hypnosis mm. you make people to believe in what you say yeah because you can say something and then people can reject that but mm. if you invite them to accept something you know which is very familiar for everyone for example say oh lift your right hand and when you look at your right hand, you all have five fingers. You know, the hypnotic language is very, very much like that. It, it makes you kind of like bored and drowsy. Right. But sometimes it doesn't always have to be. Sometimes it just allows your analytical faculty to become really busy. And then mm -hmm. when that happens, you put all the suggestion in there. So what happened when you tell everyone you have five fingers, would you reject that information? No, you wouldn't. No. So when you start accepting things, what happens is like this: on a subconscious level, you uh, you form that rapport and trust with the other person. Mm. Mm. Oh, whatever he is saying is true. Yeah. You know, what, whatever this person is telling me is true. Then whatever they say, even though it's not true, you will accept that as the yeah. absolute truth. Right, and he would literally do that. Like it, yes. exactly what you're describing, he would tell us um, the, the entire cognition of your past lives and your future lives is centered if you can put your full awareness on the tip of your nose. Now sit straight, yes. put your fingers in chin mudra, place your hands on your lap. He would give really detailed, specific, concise instructions of which foot is supposed to cross over which other foot while you're seated to that level of detail. So our minds would be so occupied about making sure that our posture is perfect and that we're sitting as per his instruction. Any other bullshit he added on top of that, we would just believe it because everything else that he said was aligning and, and making sense. Yeah. For me, you know, a lot of people might be asking if you're a clinical hypnotherapist, even though you saw that, why did you buy into that? I, was I actually deleted all those information when I was, even though I was a hypnotherapist, I was seeing all that from the being, but I deleted all those, <clears throat> excuse me, I deleted all those information because my convincer were those power manifestations. You know, mm -hmm. when I bought into that, even, you know, I was already involved in some of these healing work and a few other things that I was already doing. I was heavily into meditation and all that. So I already had some level of uh, intuition, you know, looking at a person and saying, this is what's happening in your body. This is what I'm seeing. This is the information that I'm receiving. Mm -hmm. um, for example, Darren Brown that I was talking about, he talks about that as well, where he talks about that being your subconscious mind connecting to the other person's uh, subconscious mind. So you uh, form that trust. Therefore, that subconscious mind will give, give you whatever the information that you want to mm -hmm. get from that particular person. So it's not really a divine work that happens because, you know, I'm not, I'm not here to argue whether God exists or no. doesn't exist or anything like that, but I'm talking about the power of the subconscious mind.